All right, so in an attempt to increase my video production output, today we're going to be doing something just a little bit different from my usual style of video. So the time has come once again for me to embark upon creating a new conlang, and I thought I might as well just record my work process just to show you how I make languages for anyone who's interested. So before we get into anything properly, I just wanted to say a quick but sincere thank you to all of these people. These are my patrons over on Patreon, whose generosity continues to astound me. It's a, it's a very weird feeling knowing that people are willing to donate money to you to have you continue doing what you enjoy doing. It's very, very cool. Thank you very much, guys, for your continued support. And also look forward to, I think pretty soon I'm going to revamp my Patreon, because when I set up my Patreon, I had no idea how the whole thing worked. So I'm thinking of throwing in some more rewards and some more extras in there. So look forward to that, and thank you once again. So now, moving on to the Conlang proper. So... When I begin work on a new language, the first and most important thing, as I've said many times in the past, is to establish a, a central goal that your conlang is aimed towards. So in my case, it's a naturalistic language because I think actually, yeah, I think every language I've ever made has been a natural, well, actually, no, no, I can't say that because... Okay, every language I've ever made has had the intended goal of being a naturalistic language, but, um, I mean, the vast majority of them have failed miserably at achieving that goal, but hopefully this will not be one of them. So, what this means is that I need to make sure that everything in this language adheres to naturalistic principles, and it needs to be believable as a language that could conceivably evolve in a con world. And speaking of which, yes, there is a con world for this, and I do have a con culture set up, but we'll get into more of the details of that once we get into the actual lexicon. So that's the overriding goal, is to make sure that everything is naturalistic. And then additionally, on top of that goal, I often have some idea for a grammatical or phonological feature that serves as really like the the centerpiece of the whole language that, I mean, obviously there's other bits of grammar and stuff in there too, but there's one, like, main point of grammar that, like, the whole language is organized around. It's sort of like the defining feature of that conlang. So, in this case, I'm going to do something that I've been wanting to do for a really, really long time now. I would like to make a system of mandatory auxiliaries in a similar way to Basque. So if you're not familiar with Basque, I grabbed a random example. Uh, so in this phrase, ikusten nuen, which I probably butchered that because honestly, I, I still have no idea how to handle the, the S, Z alternation in Basque because the whole apical alveolar and laminodental distinction is just completely beyond me. But anyway, so this phrase here means I could or used to see. And the way it breaks down is this bit, the ikus part, is the stem of the word that means to see. And this ten is an imperfective uh, participle. And this bit, nuen, is actually a past tense conjugation of a verb that means something like is or have, kind of. It's a very semantically weak verb. But really, it's just an, a verbal auxiliary. So... This is just the participle, and then all of the tense and aspect information goes on to the auxiliary. So every single sentence in Basque works like this. Every verb comes with a mandatory auxiliary that encodes the bulk of the grammatical information, while the actual verb or the semantic content is in a lexicalized form, like a participle or a normalization, something like that. So I really, really like this system. And I want to do something similar. Not exactly the same, but something similar. So that's point number one. That's going to be the main feature of grammar that I'm going to be making sure is prominent and just a fundamental feature of what I'm doing. The next thing, I'd really like to make this language have vowel harmony. And this occurred to me because it actually struck me recently that as much as I 
absolutely love and adore vowel harmony, I only have one language that has vowel harmony, and that's Okolawak. And actually, the system in Okolawak is really like brain dead simple. It's just a very basic height harmony system. There's only two pairs that participate in vowel harmony. There's uh, e versus e and u versus o, and then r is a neutral vowel, and just all the vowels in a word need to agree in height, and that's it. So I'm not really satisfied with that. For this language, I'd like a big proper vowel harmony system, and not just a proper vowel harmony system, a messy vowel harmony system. I want lots of exceptions and neutral vowels and harmony blockers and all that other fun stuff. Something akin to, like, Finnish or Mongolian, something like that. So that will be great fun to play around with. And the last little note here, I'd like to include some sort of non-concatenative morphology. Now, I don't mean anything you know, big and fancy like the triliteral root system from the Semitic languages or anything on that scale. But I'm thinking of, you know, I quite like to have verb forms that aren't so transparently related to each other. I like it when the paradigm of a verb, you look at one form and then you look at another and you're like, how are these related exactly? So I'm going to try and use non-concatenative morphology to make that happen, maybe with some umlaut, some vowel alternation stuff, maybe even some consonant gradation as well. That would be cool. So these are my main points. This is, this is the only thing that I've prepared for this language thus far. So the majority of conlangers, including me as well, will say that you start with the phonology, then you move on to grammar and syntax and all that stuff later. But in actuality, my method is quite a bit more scatterbrained than that. I tend to jump around quite a bit. So actually, I start with a sketch for these goals. I try to come up with how they'll be incorporated into the language before I do anything else. So the first thing on my list of priorities is the auxiliary system. So that is actually what I'm going to do first. Now, what we're going to do, I hope this is working. So this is going to be really weird. I'm going to have to practice thinking out loud as I'm doing this. So, where do we start? Well, I really like the idea of having a lexical verb that is rendered as one of several different types of participles or converbs or nominalizations or what have you. And it's accompanied by the auxiliary, which can be rendered in one of several different tenses. We'll call them tenses for simplicity. And then the final you know, tense aspect mood in coding comes from pairing one of the participles with one of the tenses. And it's the combination of the two that actually gives the final um, encoding. I hope that actually makes some degree of sense outside my own head. So that means that what we'll want to end up with is basically like a table. Man, this is awkward. Like, Usually I do this part with a pen and paper, but I'm going to have to practice drawing on a computer, I guess. So I'm going to have like a table with like lexical verb forms on the left and then auxiliary verb forms on the right. And so each of the quadrants, those aren't quadrants, what do you call those? Oh, Octrants? What do you call a table that's divided into eight quad? Anyway, uh, each one of these boxes is, you know, like this one might be passed. And if you combine the same participle with this other auxiliary form, it might be the future. Or you get the idea. So we're going to have to make a big table. Now, yes, this is obviously it's going to look a lot more fancy than this when I'm done with it. So for me, the easiest way to do something like this is to think about how the tense auxiliary system evolved. So, oh, by the way, I should mention right off the bat that if you don't care for or don't use the historical approach to conlanging, you know, having a proto-language and evolving the modern language from it, then 
you should probably just stop watching this video right now, because that's pretty much exclusively what I use. So, yeah, you have been warned. And also, I hope to perhaps convince some of you of the merits of using proto-langs throughout this series, although I will also dispel what I believe to be a couple of misconceptions about... I think there's a bit of a false dichotomy concerning proto-langs versus modern langs, but we'll get into all that as we go. So the question is, where did this auxiliary evolve from? Because if it's a requirement of all sentences to have this auxiliary, then I'd imagine that it probably evolved from some old tense aspect encoding that then became mandatory. A bit like how in English there was uh, a distinction between the continuous and the what do you call it? The not continuous? Simple, simple, there we go. A distinction between the simple and continuous with the word is, like I go versus I am going, but now the uh, so-called continuous form with the copula is rapidly becoming the new standard present tense, and the old simple is now becoming the habitual. So if that sort of trend continues, then you could see how the copula is would just become the standard for a present tense verb, or even in engulf other tenses while it's at it. So what we want to end up with is a system where there's a lexical verb that ends in some sort of participle. I'm just going to call it a participle for now. We'll figure out exactly what it is later on. And then there's an auxiliary, mandatory auxiliary, that has the tense aspect mood information as part of it. Um, I haven't thought about person marking and stuff like that yet. We'll, we'll get into that later. For now, I just want to sort the tense stuff out. So how do we get to that stage? So then, in the proto-language, there wouldn't have been this auxiliary. But how would their tense system have worked? So somewhere between the proto-lang and the modern-lang, some auxiliary got incorporated. I'm just going to go ahead and say that it was the copula. So the copula plus whatever the participle is came to be used for some sort of construction, and I don't know what yet. So the copula, when the copula gets incorporated as a as an auxiliary verb, which happens a lot, like a lot, um, very often it will either be um, have a continuous slash imperfective encoding, or it can do the exact opposite and have like a perfective or completed encoding. Like in the Latin, oh boy, I'm going to get this wrong now, the, is it the Latin pluperfect that has the complete paradigm for the perfect copula, just suffix straight onto the verb stem. So then I'm thinking, okay, if we do copula plus one participle, we get, well, we get a continuous type thing. And if we do the copula plus some other possible, we get a, I'll call it a perfect for now. Yeah, these, these terms will be, uh, will be changed around a lot. I don't concern myself with terminology too much, especially in the, in the early stages. So the copula can, now that I think about it, can also be used uh, to encode the future as well. So like in English, uh, you can say something like, um, I am to see my friend on Thursday. I mean, it sounds kind of pompous, but you could say that, and that is just the copula plus the infinitive. So I have a third 
participle. Again, not necessarily a participle. I'm just calling it that for now. But that could well, that could be used for the future as well. Wow, we've basically got our perfect, imperfect, and future already set up just from the copula. Wow. But this system, you notice that the copula is all in the same form. So what happens if the copula is in a different tense? This is assuming that it's the the present tense. So then, or whatever the default unmarked tense is, which is usually the, the present tense. Alternatively, I could imagine that any of these, or especially the future, could actually be the result of suppletion. So, like a future, well, a future copula, and one of the other participles. So the question becomes, where did these participles, as I'm calling them, come from? The obvious thing would be to have one of them be just a straight up nominalization. So I'm just going to say one of the participles. We'll just say participle one for now um, evolved from an infinitive, which in of itself um, probably came from just like infinitives usually evolve from just like um, a word that means like thing or act like an abstract noun um, suffix onto the verb stem so that's one possible source another source could be converbs I absolutely love converbs um, which are like um, they're essentially adverbial forms of verbs um, so like rather than using some conjunction uh, like while or after or until or something like that there would be a specific verb form that encodes that conjunction um, I used converbs a lot in the Kachti. Um that was one of the like the main things I wanted to do with that language so I'm probably if I do use converbs I'm not going to use them as profusely as I do in Nakachdi, but I don't think one or two converbs would be too much of a problem. So could have a converb. See what immediately springs to mind is to have like a perfective versus imperfective converb. Because those are the two basic types of converb. Okay, so that means if we are going with this converb idea, then if we say that you can combine the copula with these converbs, then that means that... So when used on their own, they'd be just basic adverbial forms. But if used with the copula as the main verb, then that would mean, especially if the copula came from some verb of posture like it usually does, like to stand or sit or lie, something like that, then you could get a form that means, with the imperfective converb, like a continuous thing, like I stand while doing something, would be the basic, the, the way to interpret an imperfective converb plus the copula. So that would give us our continuous and for the perfective, it's basically the same thing, except it's like, I stand having done such and such, which is like, I have done. So that gives us our perfect. Cool. So that actually gives us exactly what we were looking for down here. So it looks like the imperfective and perfective are going to be our two key participles, at least for now then using the verb on its own would just be a sort of simple aspect, unless, unless there was a system before this that this system then replaced. So there probably would have been some other imperfective, perfective type thing that then this came along and took over, except, of course, the only verb that would maintain this old system would be the copula itself, and that's where the actual tense marking on the copula comes from. Right. 
Okay, that gives us something to work with. I'm going to say the system in the old language had an imperfective, had a perfective, and I don't know, maybe a future. So they would be marked by some other morphological thing that later on in history the copula will then inherit. That means we're going to have those three forms of the copula. So at first this will just be pretty straightforward. So we just combine them like the perfect and the imperfective with the imperfective converb. That would be like I sat while doing such and such or I stood while doing such and such. So that is a pretty basic past continuous. And then the future, exactly the same thing. I will stand while doing such and such, which is a future continuous, yeah. Then we combine the perfect and the perfective. Ah, so that would give us then like a double past. So it would be I stood having done such and such, which would be like a pluperfect. And then the future and the perfective would be like I will stand having done something, so that's a future perfect. I mean, those are pretty straightforward. So the thing is, I want there to be more participle or non-finite forms. That's the word I've been looking for this whole time, non-finite, there we go. I want more non-finite forms for the lexical verb. So that means that I mean, there is the infinitive. I can do something with that. I think the, the best way to do it is to say that there was something, uh, there was another participle before the converbs or after the converbs that replaced them or preceded them respectively. Um, if I said that the right way around, I can't remember. So I like the idea that the, I mean, converbs are so useful I want them to still be around in the modern language. So I'm going to say there was something around before that. Let's say that there was this mystery infinitive thing that preceded the evolution of any of the converbs. So then I guess in this older context, using the copula with the infinitive, if the infinitive is just a general, you know, participle type non-finite thing, then using the copula would just add a continuous aspect to it. So it would turn a basic imperfective into a continuous, or maybe actually not just a continuous, what about a progressive? Maybe. I don't know if that's going to have any relevance to anything, but I'm going to call it a progressive because I can do that. And then with a perfective, what, what is a continuous perfective? Yeah, so we'll call that a past progressive and a future progressive. So that means that when these new forms come along, they will override the old ones. The old ones will weaken in sense to accommodate the new ones. Okay, okay, so actually hold on, hold on. If the infinitive imperfect combo back in the day was a continuous, then initially when the imperfective converb evolved, that became a sort of progressive thing. And that means that the original weakened in sense to become just a plain old present. So then the perfect with the infinitive would just become a simple past, or maybe actually, yeah, maybe even just a perfect, just a plain old perfect. Then future form, again, we're just saying it's going to lose its continuousness to become just a regular old future. I mean, I like it, I just don't really like how transparent it is. 
like you can see very clearly that this is the future column and this is the continuous row and this is the past and you know it's it's just a little bit too formulaic for me well it occurs to me that we need not have just one copula we could have another copula we could have a locative copula okay so if these are the result of the standard copula mixing with a verb in the infinitive, then if we had a locative copula, how would that affect things? Well, that sort of depends on their etymology. Okay, so what if we say the copula, the standard copula came from an old word that means to live? That's a pretty common pathway. And then the locative copula then would come from a word that means to stand. With the etymology of these words in mind, then the continuous, rather than being from the standard copula, could be the locative copula, because it's like, I stand doing something. So it implies that you're doing it over a duration. So that could be the continuous interpretation, whereas with the imperfective interpretation, so with the standard copula then, that could become, if it's like, I live doing something, then you do it habitually. So that would give us a habitual aspect. Wonderful. So the perfect tense and the locative copula with the past progressive, again, I'm going to shift the progressive down. And same with the future, that's going to get moved down to the locative copula. Then the perfect, what does that, what does that imply? So I lived doing something, why that's the past habitual. And then with the future and the copula, it's like, I will live to do something, which I'm not really sure how that would get interpreted in a way that's different from the future progressive slash continuous. It's, hmm, because there's no future habitual, or at least I don't think I've ever seen a future habitual in a language. Um, it probably does exist somewhere, but hmm, I don't know. I'm going to leave that one blank for now, because I'm going to say Either it's just like another way of encoding the future continuous slash progressive, or maybe that form just doesn't exist, like the future never got associated with the copula, the standard copula anyway. Okay, I've just seen that I've got the perfect on here twice. All right then, what do we do about that? Well, that corresponds to the past progressive, which if we're saying they just lose their progressive aspects, then we might as well just say it's a simple past. There we go. Now we've got a distinction between past, past continuous, and perfect. Actually, hold on a moment. Okay, okay. Uh, let me try this. Here's an idea. What if, rather than being interpreted as a continuous, the Locative copula, like I said way down here, what if the locative copula was instead, when combined with the infinitive, interpreted as a future? So that's how the future was formed in the old language. And in fact, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just get rid of that. Maybe. I don't know, I'll get back to that in a second. But then, yes, with the perfect combined with the copula, that would mean I stood doing something, which I could justify that could still be interpreted as a past progressive. I think I'm going to go ahead and just axe that column. Okay, so now that means our table would look something like this. And it also means that, so the imperfect form 
of the locative copula when combined with the infinitive back in the day, if that was a future, then it could either remain as a future, or, or very often what happens is that old futures become subjunctive. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stick that in there for now, but I might change that. We'll see. I'm gonna leave that as a simple past for now, but that means the regular copula, what have we got? I like having a habitual and the past habitual. But then what happens when the imperfective and perfective converbs get involved? Maybe this language has a distinction between a habitual or an, a habitual slash iterative, like a durative type thing, versus I'm going to say gnomic, like just a general tenseless, timeless thing, maybe. So the perfect copula combined with the imperfective converb would be like, I lived while doing something. What about if the past habitual moves down so this becomes the new past habitual, and the old past habitual is now weakens in sense to become a remote past, maybe like a remote past or experiential type thing. Then the copula, standard copula, now with the perfective, so it's like I live having done something. Oh, actually, I'm living having done something. That, that strikes me immediately as a very experiential type thing. Now, very often you can get away with having a remote past serve double duty as an experiential, but in this case, I'm going to keep them, I might keep them separate. Maybe. So finally, the perfect copula combined with the perfective converb would be like, I live, no, I lived having done something, which would be another pluperfect type thing. Hmm. Instinct tells me that, I don't know, the standard copula live has so much more of a habitual connotation that, hmm, I think I'm going to move the pluperfect over to the standard copula. We're missing one. Well, let's have a look at the big picture then. See, I like it. The only problem is now we have no future at all. Maybe it would be simpler and easier if the locative copula was just used as a future auxiliary. So, if instead of being a past continuous slash progressive type thing, if it was a future in the past, so it's like, I was to stand. So yeah, that would be a future in the past type thing. A future in the past is ripe for conditional, so... So I think it makes more sense for the future in the past to become a subjunctive or conditional type thing, like I was going to do something. That's a very common pathway for it to become a subjunctive or arealis or conditional. And that means maybe the future, maybe the future stays as a future. If there's nothing that comes along to fill it, but maybe something does, who knows? Let's see. So then, if it's a straight up future, if it's interpreted as a future marker, then with the imperfective on top of that, I guess future continuous is fine for now. We can have a future continuous. I mean, we've already got some pretty uh, 
pretty precise tense distinction, so I think we can accommodate that. And then, perfective and imperfective combined. So that's like, I will having done, so that is our future perfect. I could, I could make the future continuous the standard future and then have the old future become a subjunctive. And that means that the old future in the past would become a, I guess, a conditional. So this language would contrast between subjunctive and conditional in the same way that Spanish does. Well, ignoring that for the time being. So then for the perfect combined with the imperfective converb, um, that's, I think a past continuous is still fine for that because it's like, you were in the past and the action was continuous as you were doing it, so that makes sense to me. And then finally this box then will be the perfect and perfective, which is like, I was having done something. So, all right, that, I mean it makes enough sense for that to be, if that's a perfect, so in fact, I could get away with calling this the straight up imperfect, or past imperfect if you prefer. I always think of the imperfect as happening in the past anyway. Actually, hold on. Does it make more sense to have, ooh, hmm. So it occurs to me actually that this perfect we've got here, that combination of perfect and perfective, since it's a double pass, that's really crying out for, hmm, I guess a pluperfect, because it's like, I was standing having done something. So, see the copula is really tied up in tenseless stuff, or like, durative. I guess that's the general theme, is that the copula is like, durative? So what if then for the perfective, if it was originally a past habitual, with the perfective on top of that, it would be like, so I can see that turning into an experiential. Of course, another problem that I've just seen is that we have no present tense at all. Okay, that's a problem. Um, I mean, sometimes you can get away without having a present tense, but I think in this case, we're, we're making some pretty fine tense distinctions here, so I think it only makes sense to have a present tense. The question is, where and how? Hmm. Okay, hold on, wait, wait. I think I got it. So, going back to these, the original tense system in the protolang. Okay, if I just rough in for a second that the imperfective is unmarked and the perfective is marked, then that means that maybe this one, the imperfective plus copula, is not a habitual, but rather, so in, in the basic system, the unmarked imperfective just means that the event happens, and it's implied that it has a duration, but it's not emphasized. The marked perfective then, then serves to emphasize that it's completed or bound in some way. Therefore, there is room for, if we say that the imperfective plus the copula, maybe that highlights the continuousness of it. If we just say that that's a continuous then, that becomes a past continuous. Then, how does that impact things? So what was the continuous? Maybe that weakens in sense to become just a plain old present. And then, it wouldn't be a habitual anymore. So that would be the present plus an imperfective converb. So that would be like, I am while doing something. So that would be the new present continuous. Right, so that makes some degree of sense. 
Ooh, ooh, actually, hold on. I think I can take that a step further. Okay, so what if, what if we pull an English and say that the old present weakens to become a habitual? There we go. And that means that the new present continuous, because I mean, it's kind of rare for present to be distinguished from present continuous. Usually they're just sort of synonymous. So that then can be the standard present. Wonderful. And that means that the imperfective combined with the perfective, there's still a question of what that actually means. Hmm. So in the proto-lang, that was just an old continuous. But then it would have weakened in sense at some stage to just become a standard present type thing. So then with the perfective on it, yes, yes, yes. Then with the perfective, it would have just become a standard perfect. Great. So let me just have a look over this one more time just to make sure that I haven't missed anything out again. The more I look at it, the more I don't like the future continuous thing. I think I'm going to get rid of that and instead have that. So I'm toying with either moving the future down to the imperfective converb and then having a distinction between the subjunctive and the conditional. Or if I should keep the future with the infinitive and maintain the future continuous, because this imperfective converb, it does really have a pretty inescapable continuous implication. I think I'm just compelled to move the future down and then move the subjunctive over and have that one be conditional. Okay, so I think that is actually pretty good. I'm quite happy with that. So as a recap, in the proto-language, there were only two verb forms. There was the unmarked form of the verb, which is interpreted as an imperfect, and then the perfect was formed by applying some marking to the verb. We'll figure out exactly what that is later. And that marking served to signify the for lack of a better term, completedness of the verb. Then, two constructions involved using the two copulae as auxiliary verbs. So then the standard copula combines with the imperfect verb form to create a continuous interpretation, and the perfect verb form for the past continuous. So yeah, really this, the copula, the standard copula, basically began its existence um, as a verbal auxiliary uh, that encoded the continuous or progressive aspect. Then the locative copula was used as a sort of future. And then, that was fine for a while, but then these two new forms, the converbs evolved, and when they evolved, they're just a really convenient way of marking essentially what amounts to the continuous and completed aspects in and of themselves. So the old forms then weakened in sense, and then these new tenses of all. So that gives us two different auxiliaries, each with two different forms inherited from the old system, and then those combine with the let's go verb that has one of three different forms that produce these tenses. So I'm quite happy with that. And I think I'm going to call it there for now. I might dwell on it a bit and maybe tweak a few things. And if I do, I'll update you in the next one. The next time then I think we'll actually crack on with the vowel harmony system and get that sorted because that's next on our list of priorities. So if you have somehow actually made it to the end of this video, um, thank you very much. I hope, I'm sorry if it was really scatterbrained and all over the place. Um, I hope it was at least vaguely interesting. So again, don't worry, these videos, this series shouldn't interfere with my 
usual upload schedule at all. Um, I'll just do these whenever I can, whenever I get some free time. And if you like this video, please let me know. If you didn't like this video, please let me know. Any sort of feedback is appreciated because I have honestly no idea if people are going to find this interesting or not. So let me know. And yeah, thanks very much. I will see you next time. Take care.